this morning is taken from Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Take heed that ye do not your alms before men, to be seen of them. Otherwise you have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore, when thou dost thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may bring glory or may have glory of men. When I say unto you, they have their reward. But when thou dost alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, that thine alms may be in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading and to the hearing of his words this morning. Stand again. Living for Jesus. <clears throat> Jesus, a life that is true, striving to please Him in all that I do, being a legion, glad-hearted and free, this is the pathway sing for me oh jesus lord and savior i give myself to thee for thou in thine atonement didst give thyself for me i own no special needs. Uh, we think of uh, Brother Homer this morning is still having some problems and is in a lot of pain and need to keep him in your prayer thoughts as well. We had uh, James Bartlett on our prayer list. Uh, James, I'm sure, is home now and probably uh, needs a special prayer as well. Uh, pray also for Chastity Perkins. Uh, she was added to our prayer list as well. Pray for her, she has cancer, and she needs special prayer at this time as well. Uh, and there are many others, I'm sure, that we're not even aware of that need special prayer. So our hearts go out to those this morning and, 
in a special way. Before we have an hour to our prayer, let's uh, just to look to the Lord for His guidance and direction, for new hope, the future of new hope, the future for our country. Uh, this past week we had an election, uh, and we just trust that the Lord has put one in office that He would want to lead this country. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you this morning for all that you're doing in our lives. Father, I just pray today for those that have special needs. We pray for Brother Homer. Uh, continue to be with him, minister to him, lift him up and strengthen and encourage him. Uh, he's a real testimony for us here at New Hope, and I'm sure a lot of times he comes, uh, probably doesn't feel like coming, but he wants to come and be a part of us, and we thank you and praise you for that. Pray for Chastity uh, Perkins. We pray for James Bartlett. We don't know all the situations there, but Father, you do, and pray that you'd minister to them and supply those needs. Now this morning, as we come to this part of the service, a time that we can come and give back to you a portion of that which you have richly blessed each of us with. Ask now that you'd bless the gift and the giver. Thank you again for all that you're doing in this life of new hope and pray that we'll continue to support ministers and missionaries all over the world help us to reach those that are lost we ask these things now in jesus name amen well we come down the wire today we're going to be finishing the uh, spiritual gifts and uh, there are seven working gifts and uh, there were other gifts that are mentioned in the scripture, but we focused on the seven working gifts. And just before I, I start, I want to mention a couple of other gifts. One would be the pastor-teacher gift. We're not going to spend a lot of time on that, no time at all really. But basically the pastor-teacher gift is a gift where a person that is called to the ministry, and he, the pastor aspect of it, it would be the shepherd. He shepherds the flock. He's the leader of the flock. Uh, he's been called by God, and uh, this means that uh, he's not more important than anybody else in the congregation, but he's someone who has been called to lead a particular church, a group of people, in the future spiritually, uh, onward and forward in their walk with Christ. The teacher aspect of it would be his job is also to teach the Word of God. And so we have a combination of the shepherd and, 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 and the teacher, someone that is teaching the Word of God. Also, it does mention the evangelist. The evangelist would be somebody like a Billy Graham or Frank Graham or, or many of the others in, in past years that have uh, uh, ministered around the world, and they just seem to have the gift. They, they can preach the same message the pastor preaches, and yet because they have the gift of evangelism, the people will flock to the front. The Holy Spirit just seems to use the message that they have and to draw people onto himself. I think that any church, our church, any church, on a regular basis should have someone that comes in on a regular basis to, uh, to preach the gospel to get people saved. Even though people can be saved during, during the service and are saved during the course of the year uh, because the evangelist has that special gift, uh, they're out there and they're, they're there for the church. And uh, we think of them in, the, in, 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 a, in an auditorium or coliseum or something like that, like the Billy Graham. But, I can remember when I was younger, and some of you can remember where on a regular basis we had evangelists come in to the church and they would preach. You think if you see some of the older movies and you see uh, the tent meetings that they had, these were evangelists that came into these tent meetings and people in the town flocked together and people just came forward when the Word of God was given and received the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. So, uh, and then you have the gift of apostleship. The apostle would be, today, would be somebody that is sent out as a missionary. And we think of a missionary sometimes as someone is, that, that goes out there and to preach the gospel. That, not necessarily the case. A missionary can do anything. It can be a secretary. Uh, I know people that have been in the building business, that have given up their business and uh, gone in another part of the world, and now they have a crew in another part of the world, and they're building churches and homes for people. And this is the missionary effort that they have. We see what goes on with Samaritan's Purse and what they do. They send a crew of people into an area like North Carolina that's been hit by a hurricane. And uh, they, they're there not only to witness to the people, but to physically help these people in their time of distress that they have. So this would be the apostle. 
I would like to mention also the apostle who is the missionary. Remember, the missionary is not only the person that goes from our doors out across the, the country to another, to another country, but the missionary is right here at, at home. And if the church itself is not healthy, we focus on giving a lot of money, and we do give a lot of money to missions across the world. But it's just as important to make sure we give enough money locally so that the church is strong, because if the church isn't here, the missionary is not going to be sent out. There's not going to be any money to send them out. So the missionary effort is not only a, across the country, but it's right here in our own state. Remember, the Bible says, and home first, your state, and in the world. I stated a little different than the Bible stresses it, but it talks about at home first. Your first responsibility is to make sure that you're healthy. If you want to have a healthy future for your children, you need to have a healthy home, right? It starts at home before they're sent out into the world. So uh, those are the other gifts, and there are many other areas in the Bible that talks about a gift, but the ones that we have focused on are the seven working gifts. Now, as I went into some of the commentaries, it was unbelievable how many verses I came up with that had to do with giving. Um, and remember, even though we've focused on a dominant gift, every single Christian has a dominant gift. In other words, a gift that God has given you that is dominant over and above and strength in all of the other gifts. But you also have the other gifts that are lesser gifts. Some of them are stronger, some of them are weaker. And as we'll end today, we'll talk about that a little bit when I talk about the mix. Because as you're listening each week to what I say about the gift, some of you are going to say, hmm, not all of that is me, that's my gift, but that doesn't sound quite right, and that's correct. Because they're going to be different based upon what the secondary gifts are that are close to it. We'll talk about that a little bit more a little bit later. But one of the commentaries said this, and I had to share it with you because I thought it was pretty good about the gifts. It says, the Bible emphasizes giving is a way to show love for God. Trust in God's supply and establish God's kingdom. It is a sacrificial act of generosity that involves giving up something valuable for the sake of others. The Bible also teaches that giving is a way to witness God's character by demonstrating his love, generosity, and his faithfulness. And then it says, as a verse of scripture says, do not give to the point of poverty, give to the point of equity. So it's saying here that when we give, we need to give res responsibly. Uh, not to sacrifice to the point of where our family is hurting, but we give we give out of heart of joy. The Bible tells us when we give, we should be joyful about our giving. If you're not joyful in your giving, then I wonder what spiritual benefit the giving is if you do not give it with a joyful heart. I, I want to share some verses with you. And the, as I said, it's just a few verses that talks about giving. The first one is 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 8. It says, whosoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whosoever sows generously will also reap generously. And I think of the farmer. I think of Garnett over here as he sits over here. If you sow three or four seeds, you're going to get maybe a plant or two, maybe. You're not going to get much results of just a few seeds. But if you sow a hundred seeds, even though all of them might not germinate, you're going to have a much bigger crop. So it's saying here that whatever you give will depend on what you receive. And it's talking about a blessing. Your giving is a blessing. And because you give, and you give out a heart of joy, God is going to bless you. How much he's going to bless you depends upon how much you give. The second one is found in Luke eleven thirteen. It says, if you then, though you are evil, know how to give gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Now, what is this verse talking about? It's talking of the difference between a believer and a non-believer. If a person that is outside of Christ, not a believer in Christ, they can love their family, they can do good things, they know the difference between good and evil. And, uh, but it's saying here, but those who are in Christ, how much more this is going to benefit because he has given you the best gift of all, and this is the Holy Spirit. 
And so it's talking about the spiritual versus the non-spiritual, even though both parties can give. One has a spiritual uh, connotation and the other one does not. Proverbs 37, 21 says, Some people are always greedy for more, but the godly love to give. Psalm 37, 21 says, The wicked borrow and do not pay back, but the righteous give generously. <clears throat> Proverbs 11.24 says, One gives freely, yet grows all the richer. Another withholds what he should give and only suffers want. And once again, it has to do with you, if, you, if, if you give sparingly, you're not going to get much out of it. If you give more, you're going to receive an awful lot more uh, because of the giving that you're giving. 1 John 3.17 says, If anyone has a material possession or has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Um, that should make a lot of us feel a little bit guilty, I think. We, sometimes we, we kind of just look by those, thing, those people that are in need. And um, like the Good Samaritan story in the Bible, where all those people passed by, and yet somebody that was considered as an enemy, a, a Samaritan, stopped, and he gave that person everything that was needed to help that person along. That person showed the love of God. The people that were supposedly religious didn't really show the love of God in what they were doing. Galatians 2, uh, 6, 2 says, <clears throat> Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fill the love of Christ we have a responsibility to carry one another's burdens. You have the responsibility to carry my burden, I have a responsibility to carry your burden. And this is all has to do with, with God's love being extended through us to other people. And this has an awful lot to do with about the family of God, the church of God, being a part of the family and knowing others, others' needs. And as you heard pray this morning, as we prayed for Homer and prayed for others, that God, this is, this is extending God's love through us to other people that will benefit as a result of us being faithful in, in doing that. So we, we do have a responsibility for our brothers and sisters' burdens. And then Luke 12, 23 says, Give and it will be given to you a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, and it will be poured into your lap, for the measure you use, it will be measured to you. So all of these verses tell us that the more we give, the more we're going to receive. But our attitude should never be that we give to receive. God wants us to give out of a heart of that whatever we give is going to be a blessing to somebody else. And therefore, it will bless God, and God will bless us. It has, to do with, it has to do with an attitude, doesn't it, that we have. And by all means, right up at the top, I want to say you need to give with joy. If what you give doesn't give you joy, then take a look at what you're giving. I remember a number of years ago, many years ago, when our family was young, I served on a, on a, on a Christian counseling center in uh, Concord, New Hampshire, and uh, our church sponsored it, but all of the churches in the area took benefit of it. We had an attorney, we had a, a CPA, and we had a psychologist. Uh, I did the financial aspect of it, and people would come in for counseling, uh, whatever their needs were. But I remember one particular family that came in, and uh, he was an accountant for a large billion-dollar company. And his words to me were, I can manage the funds, billions of dollars a year for the company that I work for, but I can't manage my own household. And they were in disastrous situations. Now what happened in these situations that people would bring in their shoeboxes of the receipts and everything else and say, this is it, and these are all our bills, and this is what we get for income, what do we do? And uh, so Jan and I would go home and put this all together and come up with a budget in a period of time that they get this all paid off and so on. But I remember in that conversation, and not everybody is necessarily going to agree with what I'm saying, but it has to do with the joy aspect of it. I remember that he made a statement. He says, we don't even have any money left over to give to church. He said, but we're giving money to the church. 
and it hurts. And I says, are you getting any joy out of it? And he says, not at all. I said, does God need your money? And he thought about it for a moment. And I ask you that, does God need your money and my money to accomplish what he wants to accomplish? God is God. He doesn't need anything from us if what he wants us to give, doesn't he? But he tells us that whatever you give, give out of joy. And so I says, give something, but give something that you feel that you can give, even though it's sacrificial, but you're doing it, and you're doing it with joy. And he came back a few months later, and he says, you know, that just took the biggest burden off my shoulders. He said that we're giving, and we're, and, and we're giving more and more and more, but we weren't able to give much. But what we're able to give, we gave in joy, and God is seeming to bless us. And this is the point that I want to get across on this word, giving. No pastor likes to sp speak on giving money, uh, and yet the Bible has so much to say about it. Uh, you can go to the Old Testament, and the Old Testament will tell you that you need to do this and you need to do that, but um, we're in the New Testament times, and I think God wants you to give out of a heart of joy. And uh, someone asked the question, do I give on my net or my gross? You think about that for a moment. What do you want God to bless you with? Your net or your gross? What really makes the difference, right? I, I don't have an answer for that, but that was a good question. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's the net that you take home and what you've got to spend, right? Right? Okay. All right, let's take a look at the gift of giving. First of all, the part of the body that's used is the ears. They hear the needs. They're constantly listening for the needs that are out there. Their shortest link is to God. It's the closest to God. The common denominator for the person with the gift of giving is God. Because what they're doing in their eyes is very, very important and very spiritual. Their greatest joy is con conceptualizing and sensing that his or her contribution enables the accomplishment of spiritual objectives. I remember watching a television program where an older couple got up and uh, gave a testimony, and they were obviously very wealthy millionaires. And uh, someone asked him, the, the person that was asking the question says, what is your goal in life? And they said, our goal is that before we die, leave this earth, that we have distributed all of the wealth that we have to the various charities around the world. Wow. That's thinking ahead, isn't it? But that's how the giver thinks. They want what they give to accomplish the most that they can accomplish. The amplification of the gift, this person initiates creative ideas. This is not one of the speaking gifts. This is one of the serving gifts. This is a person that is very quiet. They're not a conversational person necessarily or a person that's up front and talking or a person in a, in a meeting that will have an awful lot to say but they have some fantastic ideas, and if you ask them, they'll give those ideas, and they're probably the most valuable ideas in the whole group because of who they are and the gift that they have. They think original concepts. Uh, they think in absolutes, or in other words, final results. If I give such and such, what is gonna be the final results spiritually? They feel inadequate, but they trust that what he or she has will enable others to accomplish their ministry. They protect their assets, always broadening the dollar base so that he or she can give longer. I remember a number of years ago, a friend of mine married the granddaughter of an elderly man in New Hampshire, and he was a multimillionaire. And uh, he, lived in a, he lived in a state, he lived all alone. He'd been, I don't know what happened to his wife, she probably died many years before that. But how did he make his millions of dollars? Well, back in the days when the railroad was transpor tra transporting an awful lot of goods compared to today, it's the trucks and the airplanes. And he would go up into the state of Maine, when they, in northern Maine is known for their potato prop, uh, crops, and he would buy carload, train carloads of potatoes in the fall at harvest time. He would store them over the winter, and in the summer when the prices went up, he would sell them. And he became a multimillionaire doing this. And then he took his profits and he, he invested those profits into railroad stock. 
About the time that I got to know him, the railroad stocks were going down, the, going down the tubes. And so that whole thing stopped. But I mentioned this because he was one of the most frugal men I've ever known. He would go out along the highway back in the days when you could pick up Coke bottles and you'd get a nickel for each one. And he'd pick up Coke bottles and put them in a, in a wheelbarrow and bring them back and collect them and he'd cash them in, adding to his wealth. He would make every room in the house, whenever you left the room, boy, you better shut the light out. He shut the lights out because electricity was expensive. Okay. Very frugal, a millionaire. Uh, and he lived a very simple life. In fact, he has so much land that he could have planted a lot of potatoes himself. And, but when he threatened to plant potatoes, the government says, no, they control, you know, I don't know if they do this today with corn and stuff like that, but they control, they control the market. And sometimes they pay you not to plant something. And so they paid him per acre not to plant potatoes. So now he added to his wealth and he didn't have to do anything. He just had the land. And that's how he became wealthy. The impulsive reaction to a situation, they shut down, they tune people out. They cannot explain why or how this happens, but they come back very slowly with reservations. In other words, if you were to come to them and present them with an idea of how they ought to spend the money on a particular project, they need to fully understand all of the information and the facts involved in that. And if they don't, they just shut down. They just close down. They may come back later, but their initial reaction is to close down. And you might think that they're rejecting what you're saying, but not necessarily. They just don't have enough facts. So if you go to them, make sure you have a, a plan and you have the facts as to why they should spend that money. The greatest dangers, as, as all of the gifts, every one of the gifts has a danger of pride being involved. They feel that their ideas are always right, and this is not certainly true. Uh, they're proud of their assets. They give without discretion. They use their assets for personal gain or ulterior motives, and these are some of the pitfalls they can have to do with pride uh, when, they, uh, when, when they give. The scriptural admonition we'll find in Romans chapter 12, verse 8 and verse 13, which says, or giving, distributing to the necessity of saints and given to hospitality is their verse. They dislike emotional appeals. They want the facts. I think churches are guilty sometimes when they have a need for financially that uh, uh, Someone is going to say, and a comedian is going to say, well, you know, so-and-so has got the money, I want to go to them and ask them if they want to help. They hate that. They hate to have constant appeals for the money. This will shut them right down. Make the need known, and if the Lord works it upon their heart, they will give, and they will give generously. I think back, once again, when our family was young in New Hampshire, our church had a, had a pipe organ, and the, the pipes covered the whole wall behind the, behind the pulpit and uh, with a manual down below it. And it was originally given by the Pillsbury Flower Foundation to the church. But now many, many years had gone by, I don't know, 100, 150 years had gone by and it needed an awful lot of work. In fact, they told us it was gonna cost about $150,000 to bring it up to par. And the church didn't want to spend that kind of money. So they decided after much debate, and you can imagine much debate, uh, they would leave the pipes up there because it, they were beautiful, and they would leave the manual there, but they would get a new organ. And so a committee adjourned, and uh, they decided upon an Allen organ, and it was a free manual organ. And uh, we got a real deal at the time because they said, if you allow us to come in and show other people this organ and demonstrate it, we'll let you have it at cost for $60,000. Now, we're going back in the 1970s, and that's an awful lot of money today. It was an awful lot of money then. And so we prayed about it, and the uh, pastor made an appeal. We need to have a fund to, to raise the money for, the, uh, for this organ, $50,000. I think it was $60,000. And uh, that following week, the pastor received a fellow telephone call. And the call was from a man, and his wife he owned an art gallery, very, very wealthy in New York. And they had a summer place in New Hampshire in the, and in the summer they came up some of the weekends and for a number of years they came to our church. Most of the people never knew them. They were there and they left, they never said anything. And, but he called up 
And when he heard the need, he says, I want to I wanna donate the $60,000 for that organ. He the gift of giving. He saw the need, he had the money, an appeal was made, the Holy Spirit worked, and the money was given. I heard just probably maybe eight or ten years ago, right here locally, I think it was the Beale Memorial Baptist Church in Tappahannock. They were having a missionary conference, and someone mentioned that uh, somewhere over, I think it was Africa, that they were trying to get the people to be able to, 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 to plant and to support themselves and to have more than one crop and so on, but they had a need, and the need was for a John Deere tractor. And the pastor mentioned that in the congregation. And someone came up to him afterwards and said, you know, I know somebody that has a brand new John Deere tractor and he wants to give it to some worthy cause. And he got the two together and the tractor was sent over to Africa. Can you see how the Lord works for the giver and for the need and he puts the things together and how it's done and how it's done properly? So how do you relate to a person that has the gift of giving? You don't rush or expect to communicate beyond the realm of essentials and, and that which is relevant. You do not interpret a hesitancy to communicate as a, a disinterest or indifference as to the appeal that you're trying to make. A giver does not like the thought of the, to be thought of because of his money. We've already made that point. People come to him because of his money or giving, church appeals and so on. Givers give with a pure motive without others' knowledge about it. Once again, the scripture that was read this morning by Leonard said that. Give in private, because if you make it known what you're giving and brag about it, you have already blessed. And the scripture says this in several different places. It talks about this. Um, like going to your, your closet and praying in, in private and just you between you and God. People come to the person with a gift of giving because of his money and, uh, and that just really turns this person off. The givers give with a pure motive without others know, uh, knowing about it. The giver has more to give than money. I also think, and I've mentioned this story before in, in past months, but I was visiting with a pastor up in Maine one day, and he asked me to stay for lunch. And he said, I have somebody I want you to meet. And uh, so at lunchtime, the, his guest came and uh, sat down, and he had, he had uh, bib halls on, and uh, he was a contractor, and just a very, very quiet, meek person. And if you asked him a question, he would answer, but he wasn't volunteering any conversation. And he was a very wealthy contractor. The pastor said, whatever he, whatever he does turns into money. He gives his money away, and he just comes pouring back in. And he shared that he had built a home on the side of a mountain. And back then, I think it was about $500,000, a home for himself. He wasn't married, never been married. But he saw a family that had need of a home and didn't have a home, so he gave the home to them. He also shared, the pastor shared with him what you're doing in Mexico. And he took out his wallet and he took out some pictures and he started showing a church in the process of being made. He was providing the money for a church to be built in a little village in Mexico. They didn't have enough money, they didn't have a church in a village. He had the strong gift of giving. R.G. Letourneau, the, uh, the Caterpillar tractor man, lived on 10% of his income, multi-millionaire, 10% of his income, gave 90% of his income away. He just couldn't give it away. The more he gave, the more God blessed him, but he had the gift of giving. John D. Rockefeller, did you know that John D. Rockefeller was a staunch Baptist? Did you know that? Did you happen to see on TV Today or last night on the news that the, the, the Christmas tree, the, the Christmas tree that the huge Christmas tree they put up at Christmas time in Washington, D.C. Did you see that on the back of a truck? And there's a big banner across it, and it's the Rockefeller tree, donated by the Rockefeller Foundation. Gave millions and millions of dollars and still does toward charities and so on. He had the gift of giving, John D. Rockefeller. At his, in his time, he was the richest man in the world. 
I think he had $350 million in assets, and today that would be billions of dollars in today's money today. John D. Rockefeller. Givers give with a pure motive without others' knowledge about knowing about it. Uh, they give more than money, and that's a good point to make here. The person that the gift of giving may not have any money to give. Giving has more to do with money. What is the most valuable thing that we have in life besides life itself? Time. Once time is spent, you can never get it back. And for a person to give time to another person is probably the most precious thing that that person could ever give. It outweighs money. Time. Time. Time and ideas. Money, yes. But when somebody gives of their, of their time or gives something sacrificially for someone else, I can remember reading about um, Back in the days of the war with, with Germany, <clears throat> there were a group of men that were lined up. They had dug their own graves, and they were about to be shot in the back of the head. And somebody steps forward from the crowd. They, of course, they had in the prison camps, they had the people watching there. As an example, this is going to happen to you if, if, if you don't stay in line. And somebody says, that man has a family. He says, I don't. I want to take his place. And they pulled that man out of the line. and he, put himself in the line, and he was shot in the back of the head. Can't give more than that, can you? Can't give more than yourself. Sacrificial love, that's what that is. That's what it's all about. The church can be anemic because of a lack of ideas and is not gathering the ideas of the giver. And once again, the giver is a very quiet person. If they're sitting in on a committee, and uh, I think I've mentioned this before too, when, when I was serving as a deacon in our church in, in Maine, we'd have about 10 deacons and four or five of us would be the talking gift, and there would be four or five that had the, the service gifts, and they would sit through the whole meeting and say hey, nothing, just back and forth from those that were doing the talking and the debating and so on. But when it was all said and done by the talkers, the pastor or the chairman would say, and he would speak to each one of the people that had the gift of serving, okay, what do you think? And many, many times they would come up with a brand new idea that everybody bought, a valuable idea that would have been completely missed if somebody hadn't taken the time to say, what do you think? I want your idea. They do not volunteer, but if asked, they will give you some great ideas. <clears throat> Sometimes the giver will stand back with his ideas until he knows he is wanted and will be appreciated. A giver's ideas can stand head and shoulders above everyone else, but many times they are overlooked. And the giver has a thought pattern, but is hesitant to verbalize it because of rejection. They don't like rejection. Remember, his motive is not to give money, but to help contribute to the ministry. The money just happens to be a byproduct that helps him to do that. And so that is the gift of giving. Let me just take a moment and go back to where I started from in the very beginning about this thing that's called the mix. Now, as I've gone through this, if you have the gift of giving, you, you might say something like this. Some of that is true, some of it is not as true. And the reason that it isn't 100% is because, for instance, if you have the gift of prophecy, foretelling the Word of God, and foretelling the Word of God, and everything that you do is black and white, you're a fact-type person, uh, it's going to come across kind of, kind of bold and kind of harsh with a pure gift, but if the secondary gift that is very close to that gift happens to be the gift of mercy, it's going to, I hate to use the word water down, but it's going to water down that gift a little bit, so it's not going to be as harsh, it's not going to be quite as black and white. It's just going to be different, but the dominant gift still is, is prophesying. If, you're, if you have the gift of prophecy and you have the gift of, of uh, governments, that person is going to be able to take and, and delegate what he's saying to other people and so on. It changes, it changes the nature of the gift. So make any combination that you want or with any one of the dominant gifts, and it's going to change how that gift reacts to other people. In, in actuality, okay? Does that make sense? Okay. Had somebody say that the, one of the gifts I did a couple of weeks ago was right on 100%. 
Okay, very, very strong gift in that particular area. All right, I'm gonna finish off by just uh, kind of doing a recap, and I wanna mention also that on the table in the back as you go out, we have my notes on all of the gifts. Next week we'll have the gifts on, uh, back on the table for uh, giving, and that'll be the last week we'll have the table up there. So make sure you get your copies. If you haven't taken the test that gives you an idea of what your gift is, there are some up there, take that test. If you have any questions whatsoever, please feel free to ask me and I'll, I'll try to help you in trying to understand the, the results of that test. All right, first of all, <clears throat> a giver does not like to be thought of because of his money. Motive is not to give money, but to contribute to the ministry, which is what we just ended with. When a server gives, he wants to control the money. A prophet thinks through logically what he will do with the money. A ruler or the gift of government sees a situation, sizes it up, and then sees where his money will be a stopgap. The ruler is the blocking back of the giver. The ruler will stay behind the giver if he has a good idea. The exhorter <coughs> feels ideas are a dime a dozen. Concerned with platform people receiving more money, they see, po see people getting things done and are motivated to give to this end. Mercy sees a person's need and is motivated, motivated to see these needs with, with the giving. And the teacher weighs all the facts and reasons concerning the need before giving the money. A giver invests wisely, sets and achieves long-range goals, works to aid those needy people who are worthy of assistance, dislikes waste, gives liberally and beyond all human expectation, and uh, is prolific with good ideas. The teacher employs a logical, systematic approach to Bible study, puts heavy emphasis on responsible action in light of what is known, very critical in study, gives attention to detail, prefers a group setting rather than a one-on-one -on -one setting. The exhorter comes alongside to encourage, sets long-range goals, and expects results. The server chooses short-range goals to work on, is a hard worker, likes to be told what to do, sticks to the task until finished, joins in quickly to assist, takes orders well, supports and helps those in leadership, and the prophet sees things as black and white, proclaims the word, expresses himself verbally, dependency on scriptural truth to validate his authority, and direct, is direct, frank, and persuasive when they are speaking. So this kind of gives you an overcap of what the gifts are. I hope the study on the gifts has been a help to you and, um, and will help you in uh, serving one another in the church and helping you to move into the right area of comfort zone uh, so that you, when you, you have joy in what you're doing and serving, okay? Heavenly Father, thank you for the instruction that you have given us in your word concerning the spiritual gift. Thank you, first of all, for the most important gift that you have given. The scripture says, thanks be to God for his unspeakable gift, and that gift is the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, we just pray that uh, through the working of your Holy Spirit, as it works in our hearts and in our minds, that we might use the gift that you have given us to your glory, that your church might grow and flourish and prosper as a result of the faithfulness of your people. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you sing as we stand as we sing our closing hymn, Victory in Jesus.
Heavenly Father, what a day that will be when we'll be in heaven with you and we'll be singing a new song, a song that we do not know here, but a song that will glorify you like no other song. So, Lord, we just thank you and praise you for your love and goodness and grace and mercy. We thank you for the gift of forgiveness that you've offered to all those who will receive it. Forgive us of our sins, Lord, that we might walk close to you and be all that you want us to be. Be with us now as we depart from this sanctuary and bring us back to again together, if this is your will. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.